Well, Steve, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the story produced a lot of reaction, you know, some positive, some negative. And I, I remember when I was in college going through the old Life magazine scene, you know, in 1956, you know, go ye and preach the gospel, five do and die. And, and that was at a time where, you know, missions, Christianity had a higher cultural significance. Right. And so that even then you would have had some resistance. And, and I guess my question would be, you know, Ed Stetzer has made some comments of, and you've even made comments about the, um, John Allen Chow situation. Right. And, and there's some, you know, controversy about that, about, you know, was he using the best approach? But Ed Stetzer's comments were in 1956, you know, the, the, you know, the, the story coming out of Ecuador fueled people toward missions. And in 2018, the John Allen Chow story is people are asking, should we even be doing missions? And so I'd just like to hear from you. You know, you, you wrote an article, which I thought was really good, really challenging about the John Allen Chow. And w what would you say, you know, looking back, uh, you know, 65 years later, seeing this all, you know, this is beyond my lifetime, but you, you've seen it all from, you know, 1956 to, to now. What would your, your comments be, um, you know, to the, to, the, to the church today in 2020, you know, you know, in light of that and, and what you've seen, what would, you, what would you say to the church today in 2020, having seen it firsthand, you know, you affecting you as a five-year-old boy, and and where you're at today well yeah it it has changed i mean dad and his uh, four friends were treated like heroes and um you know all my life i've i've rarely been steve saint i've been nate saint's son or or quite often elizabeth elliot's son um i don't know how they figured that out but um close enough um, but but there, you know, the, when Dad and his friends were killed, um, people were thinking, you know, we got to take their place. And I've had, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people, um, even Chuck Swindoll, I heard on the radio saying that he was, you know, had just joined the military and he didn't want people to know he was uh, a Christian. And and then he heard about Dad and his friends being killed, and he he thought. Okay, Chuck, it's time to get off the fence. But um, now, today, it's not politically correct. I, I mean, I've heard people say, why don't you just leave those people alone? Leave them. They're happy. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, you don't know the history of the Waurani. I mean, 60% homicide rate over five generations that uh, an anthropologist, Jim Yo, studied. Um, I mean, they were a culture of death. The oldest man in the Waurani tribe, the at least the clan that killed my dad and his four friends, was about my dad's age. He was in his early 30s, and um, he was cons well. He was the oldest man in that whole upriver group of clans of the Waurani. Um, they just, I mean, they just when they'd get together, th what they talked about is killings. You know, who killed who, and. Uh, but, um, you know, it didn't start back then, the uh, controversy over whether we should obey God or should obey man started back in the book of Acts. Um, wasn't it Peter and John that mm -hmm. were called in by the uh, religious leaders and they were yeah. saying, hey, what in the world are you doing? We told you not to, not to be preaching, not to be talking about this uh, Jesus and... Um, and uh, Peter answered him and said, um, you know, you tell me, should we obey God or should we obey man? And when they were done with that uh, confrontation, it says, and I think it's Acts 4, it says that uh, they, they didn't understand how these two very simple and uneducated men could be answering so, um, so capably. And it says then they, they realized that, the these two men had been with Jesus and and it had transformed their lives. Um, you know, somebody asked my dad, um, 
Well, when he was flying over the jungle, he said, uh, you know, you're, you're risking your life. Any any time that little engine quits, you're probably going to die out there in the jungles. And my dad said, um, you know, we are we are not our own when we begin following Christ. We've been bought with a price. And he said, you know, this isn't so uncommon. He said, in the war, I remember we all understood that we were expendable. We didn't have to come back, but we had to go. And he said, uh, the same is true for sure. If we have to obey our earthly commanders in the military, how much more should we obey what God has told us to do? But I think, I think the um, the the um, the reason that it's not politically correct is that people think um, that. The objective of missions is to go and force people to believe. I think Constantine, the Roman emperor, he tried that. didn't work well for him. It just doesn't work. What really works to um, to motivate Christ followers to actually follow him is persecution. And, um, you know, with 20 grandchildren, I've been really concerned about what this world here in North America is going to be like in their lives. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, persecution is coming and pretenders all go away when the persecution starts. And then I started thinking, you know, I think the church in North America is really going to become more active and uh, more committed to following Christ's commands. And um, we call it his great commission, his great command, but... I mean, all of his commands are equally of, of equal import, but the Great Commission that you find in every one of the Gospels was Jesus saying, all authority has been given to me, now I'm passing it to you. You go and make disciples of all men, which means go and, First Timothy 2, 2, I think, says, um, go and teach people um, who can who can also teach others. It's, it's a... Um, it's a multiplication strategy, which we haven't been using in missions, but uh, you know, I'm getting a little bit long-winded there. <laughs> well, the the multiplication um, is evident from that story. It, it's, again, one chapter, but God's continuing to write more in that. And it's it's been amazing to just see and be around, <clears throat> even working with iTech and hearing the stories and even speaking of iTech. I mean, it's a it's a chapter of the story that we wouldn't be sitting here right now having this conversation if that didn't take place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, and Minkai, I mean, look at how the thing comes full circle. Um, I did 10 speaking tours with Minkai, um, not because of the movie, but the movie, End of the Spear, was a result... Of um, I had a speaking engagement up in Pennsylvania, and Minkai and Tementa had come up for uh, Jesse's graduation from high school, and so I thought, hey, instead of me flying up to Pennsylvania, let's make a road trip, which is great with Minkai and Jesse love each other, and they're always pillow fighting in the motels and things. But uh, when it was my turn to speak, I thought these people want me to tell about my dad and his four friends and they're being killed and about the Waurani. And I thought, here, here are Tamanth and Minkai. So I asked them, I got them to go up with me and I said, tell these people how how you lived before and how you live now. And um, from then on, I mean, we just got requests to go and speak. I think Minkai and I spoke, but Minkai himself spoke Personally, not not radio, not media, but personally, to probably about um, my goodness, I would guess probably more than half a million people, and and always left them with this message. He said, "How long have you had Wangungi Dimamonga? How long have you had God's markings?" Because he would talk about how violent they were and how they killed everybody and how they killed each other all the time. And then he would say, but when we started following Wangungi Taro, God's trail, 
then things changed. But he said, but the way we see those markings to follow that trail is when we do a moment, the Bible. And um, he said, how long have you people had this? And then he would very gently, he would say, maybe if you had come and told us sooner, not so many of us would have killed each other and we wouldn't have killed the outsiders and we wouldn't have been killed by the outsiders. And and that's a sobering thought. Um, There's a lot of other people out there, people groups that have no access to the gospel. And... uh, it's not our responsibility to go and make them Christ followers. It's to go and offer them Christ's um, offer of um, forgiveness and, and eternal life.